Okay, hey, um, last week we left off in uh, Exodus chapter 8, verse 15, and what we've seen transpire thus far. We're going to pick up now in verse 16, and we're going to continue on forward in the scriptures. Uh, what we've seen thus far is that God has asked Pharaoh over and over and over again, what has he asked him, guys? Anybody? What's that? Let my people go. Yeah, he's saying that. And he's being pretty polite, isn't he? He's being pretty polite. He's giving Pharaoh opportunity. Say, hey, Moses, you go and you tell him this. But we see that Moses has not done that, huh? We see that Moses has done what? What has he done to his heart? Hardened his heart. Yeah, we see that he's hardened his heart. And he's saying, you know, all I want is for my people to come and offer sacrifices to me in the desert. You know, in the wilderness, he says, and to praise him. But Pharaoh is really, really stubborn, isn't he? Remember, Pharaoh thinks he's a god. He was raised that way. He's told those things his whole life that he is like a god. And so naturally, the one god isn't going to bow down to the other one, right? So we see that kind of a thing going on, a real pride thing going on. But you know what? He has no idea what he's up against, who he's up against. Pharaoh has no idea. Pharaoh doesn't realize that who is going to win in the end. Yes. Yes, the Lord, huh? The Lord is going to win in the end. He, he doesn't realize that yet. And you know what? And, and he always does, huh? Doesn't God always win? And, and, but why do you guys think he always wins? Because he's God? Good quest, Good answer. That's true. I'm not saying no. Do you know any other reasons why? Why does God always want to win in our lives? Bingo. Dave said it. Because he loves us. Know that. That's encouraging. Because he loves you. He wants to win. And he's going to win. That's encouraging to me. In spite of all the things that I do, how knuckleheaded I am, how foolish I can be, how prideful I can be, God still works in my life because He loves me and because He loves you. In spite of everything we do, man, God loves you. And that's why He always wins. And we see here that God has already released a couple of plagues, huh? Which was the first one He did? Water, huh? Water. What water? What body of water? The Nile, the Nile, what did he do? He turned it into blood, huh? He turned it into blood. What's the second one that he did that we see that he's done already? Frogs, yes. And you guys remember that really bad joke I told last, son last Wednesday, huh? Yeah, the blind date thing, huh? Okay, so, you know, yeah, he's done two already. Two plagues he's released already. Now we're going to re uh, release a series of more plagues. But understand that, that as God does release these series of ten plagues, um, as we've covered the first two, that these plagues are not random. They're not just because God is thinking, oh, I think I'll do this because that's pretty cool. Or I think I'll do this because that's pretty cool. But pretty much they're deliberate. They're measured out purposely as far as what he's doing, the type of plague that he's doing. Remember this, that God knows that those folks in Egypt have different gods that they worship, huh? They worship all these different gods. We found out they worship the Nile. We find out that they worship frogs. We're going to find out other things that they worship as well. God is direct and deliberate in those particular plagues. But there are three things here. There are three things, three reasons why he's going to continue to be purposeful and measure out these deliberate plagues. The first reason is, is that, it's obvious, he wants to secure the release of his people from Egypt, huh? He wants to secure them, get them out of Egypt. Know this, that God is on a timetable now. God is on a timetable and he knows it's time to get his children out. And so he's going to pull out the stops, as it were, after waiting so long to release his people out of Egypt. So he wants to secure the release of his people out of Egypt because he's on a timetable and he's going to keep his what? His promise. 
He's going to keep his promises that he's already said, that he's already told. The second reason is that he wants to and he's going to judge Egypt. Know this, that inasmuch as we see the plagues going on and we see that the purpose is to get the children out of Egypt, that he's also going to judge Egypt by the plagues. As I just said earlier, huh? He's, I said that, um, that, that God is specific and purposeful in those particular plagues. And as a consequence for their sin, the sin of those in Egypt, the Egyptians and Pharaoh, the nation and the people against Israel and God's chosen people, he's going to judge their sin. Why? They've taken advantage of the children of Israel. They've used their backs, so to speak, as slave labor for profit, for building their earthly kingdom. They've done all these things, and they've used the children of Israel for that. So he's going to judge them for that. They've taken advantage of them, profiting on their blood, profiting on their back, their hard sweat, even killing them. Remember? Throwing their babies into the Nile River. You know, those types of things. So we see that God is going to judge Egypt. The third thing is that each plague he's going, like I've already said, to expose one of their gods. Because know this. We, you know, isn't it hard to love your enemies? Isn't it hard? Yeah, it's hard, huh? But know this, that even though the Egyptians were enemies, so to speak, God still loved them. He still loved them. And so, you know, yeah, he's being specific, deliberate, and purposeful, but you know this, that in exposing their gods, bringing them out to see how false and how foolish they were in trying to pay homage and to praise and to worship these false idols, these false gods, he does it because he loves them. And he's trying now to expose the folly He's trying to expose the foolishness and he's trying to say, listen, guys, I love you so much, so I'm showing you this for what purpose? To repent. To repent. See what God is greater. God Jehovah is greater. Yahweh is greater than those gods that they've worshipped. You know, it's funny because he continues to want to show them by wiping out any of their gods. He wants to wipe them out. Hey, you worship the Nile. Guess what? I have control over that. Hey, you worship the frog goddess. Guess what? I can take control over that. We're going to find out. The desert, the sands going to be turned into lice and other things. Hail and fire coming from the sky. God is in control of everything. And he wants to obliterate. He wants to tear down their, wor their gods and show them what God is greater I don't know about you guys, but if I had been worshiping some God other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord shows me those types of things, as we're going to find out here in Scripture, even the, the magicians are going, hey, you know what? Like six out of ten things have happened. Don't you think we should be kind of starting to believe this now? You know, I mean, one out of one for me would work, I would think. I'd like to think. One out of one, you know. Wow, look what's happened. What happened to you, oh, God of the, of the music stand? You didn't do anything. You didn't prevent this from happening to me. Well, I'll know that then this music stand is nothing made by my hands, you know. And, and it does nothing except hold up a book, holds up music. And so, you know, the, that's what God is trying to show them because he wants to get the children, he wants to get their children out, but he also wants to get uh, the children of Egypt spiritually as well. He wants to show them what God is more power, who, whose God is more powerful. And so we're going to see this. So he, he's done plague one and he's followed up with the other plagues. And this is, this, this is where we've stopped for last week. So let's pick up now in chapter 8 of Exodus, verse uh, 15. And it says, But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. Let's open into a word of prayer. 
Uh, Lord God, we thank you for this time. We thank you, God, for the worship, Lord, that we were able to just have you, God, through Patrick, just prepare our hearts, God, for a time of worship and just opening ourselves, Lord, up to you to receive our, to receive what you have for us tonight. So, God, as I just go through your word here, Lord, give me clarity of speech and mind, God, that I can just bring forth a message that you place upon my heart for all of us here tonight. Give us again, God, I ask, ears to hear and hearts to receive, Lord, that which you've given me tonight. Lord, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we all say and agree. Amen. 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 Okay. We see here that Pharaoh says, we finished off with the frogs, and he's saying, you know what, hey, remove these frogs, please, remove them, remove them. But we see here what happens. We see that in verse 15, but when he saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and did not heed them as the Lord had said. What's happening now? Well, the pressure's off. The frogs have been released. They've been taken away. And there's no more pressure. The pressure's gone. And with that, he, Pharaoh is seeing, hey, the, that pressure of judgment that's being thrown upon me and my nation, my people, is gone. So he, he backs off. He changes his mind. That's what he does. And you know what? That happens to us too. We do the same thing. I think you can agree to that. I've done that myself. I've done that to where there are things going on in my life and I will oh so fervently seek God and I will look up scripture and I will say, okay, Lord, I'll look back in my concordance and I'll go, oh, you know, Holy Spirit, minister to me. I'll do many things to say, Lord, Lord, Lord. He answers me. And then it's like, then I go right back to what I was doing before. Isn't that foolish? And I think all of you that are shaking your heads are going, yeah, I think I'm in the same place you are, Tom. You see, we're no different from Pharaoh in that regards. We do that in our lives too. When the pressure is released by God and he has then given us that salvation, so to speak. You know, the pressure's off. After being in the Bible and after seeking God so closely, once that trial is gone and that pressure is gone out of our life, that trial or whatever it is, they stop seeking God. Because now God is taking care of it. It's like, man, you know what? All the more reason, all the more reason we should be more fervently seeking God and once that thing is over. That's when it should really kick in. Because we've now seen and witnessed and can testify of what God has done in our life. That's not the time to cool our jets when the pressure's off. That's the time to fan the flame. That's the time to get that flame going bright. Because now you have a testimony. And like they say, without a test, there is no testimony. So it's important that we don't back off and go back to the old way of doing things or go back and forget about what God has done in our lives. It's so important. I see that here, what Pharaoh's doing. It reminds me very much of 9-11. When 9-11 hit the United States, the churches were filled with people. They were filled. All over the country, people were coming back to church. Why? Because they were like, something's going to happen. Something's going on. This has never happened. You've, these guys have rocked our world, our safety of the United States, States, States. They've gotten through the safety nets. How could they do this to us? And so people now are searching and seeking. But hey, six months later, man, attendance went down. Why? People stopped seeking God. People stopped because the pressure was off. Homeland Security came in, started covering our borders, started doing the radar, started doing all the TSA stuff, checking everything, doing all these different check balances, and now the pressure's off, right? We don't have to worry anymore. So we stop seeking God. So what happens? That translates into people not going to church because eh, they don't need to now. They already went. I see that same thing happening in that, in that instance and in that situation. Verse 16 goes on to tell us, 
So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod, strike the dust of the land, so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Here's plague number three beginning to show now. Now this is different. There's like no announcement. In the past he's been saying, you know, tell Moses or tell Pharaoh, tell Pharaoh. Here there's no announcement. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your rod. Boom, it's happening. The lice are coming. So we see here that God hits them with lice. So much so, as he compares it, then he says, the dust of the land. Strike the dust of the land so that it may become lice. Egypt being mostly desert, that must be a lot of lice, huh? Can you imagine the amount of lice that there would be? And remember, the Egyptians were clean folks. They like to think of themselves as very healthy and very clean and all this. And now all of a sudden, the dust is turned into lice. You know, have you guys ever had lice before? You don't raise your hand. <laughs> all right, don't raise your hand. Maybe your kids, I don't know, you know, you get around school and whatnot. I know Tammy's a teacher and, you know, I'm sure she deals with that all the time. You know, so... No, Tammy doesn't have lice, but I'm saying that her kids may come in with lice. But you know, that's a terrible thing. You know, and praise the Lord, they've got all this stuff to get rid of it and scrub and wash and everything. It's expensive though, huh, all that stuff when you have to get the lice out. So imagine, you know, they're, they're walking around, they're laying down, they're looking around and they see nothing but a bunch of lice. All these little bitty, itty bitty pieces of whatever just moving. On. The ground is moving. Just think of that. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> so he strikes the desert to do what? He wants them to notice. Take notice, folks. Take notice of what I'm doing and what I can do. So we go on now to verse 17. And they did so far. For Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth and it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Hmm. All the land of Egypt. All the dust became lice. Verse 18. <laughs> Amen. That would be just an incredible thing. Uh, walking on the lice, seeing what's going on. Verse 18, Now the magicians so worked their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice on man and beast. Again, telling us, reiterating to us, in their own way, even we see here that what? The magicians couldn't do anything. They couldn't produce any more lice. Lice was on them. They were dealing with it. And they were itching and scratching and doing all these. Are you guys scratching yet? Are you guys scratching? Yeah. It's kind of creepy, huh? All these things going on. So we see here that God is now bringing this, this third plague upon them. Verse 20. And the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as he comes out to the water. Then they say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. A couple things I want you to notice here in this particular passage. In verse 20, Moses does two things. He rises and rises early and he stands. You know, it's important that we as Christians take note of this. That we as Christians are to rise Rise early, get in our devotions, get in our reading, get into time with the Lord. And also, God is going to call us at one time or another to stand firm. Stand firm on, against something, in favor of something, but to hold the line, stand firm. Not, even as much as not letting Satan take a hold of your family. Because Satan will. Satan will take a hold of your marriage. Satan will take a hold of your kids. Satan will take a hold of you. I mean, as far as he can never mess with you because Christ is in you. Understand, I'm not saying that. But he can sure try and mess with your surroundings and your situations and all of those things that can just cause havoc and just kind of mess with you. He likes doing that. And so 
You know, we see here that Moses, though, was called to rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh as what he does every morning, looks like, comes out to the Nile, worshiping the Nile, doing his, you know, his daily devotions. So then it says here in, in verse 20, Then say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go so they may serve. Again, bringing his request before Pharaoh yet again. Very politely doing it. Verse 21, I like this. Or else, or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants, on your people and into your houses. The houses of the Egyptians shall be full of swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. Wow, here's the fourth plague. Swarms of flies. There's no place to go. There's no place to walk without squashing a bunch of flies. Yeah, and these weren't just house flies, guys. These weren't just little bitty flies. But these were big old, like, horse fly type things. You know what I mean? When God does it, he does it right. I mean, these were flies that were, they can look you in the eye kind of fly. You know what I mean? And they can buzz right around you. And so we see here that, you know, God is now bringing swarms of these. And the Egyptians, remember, they, they worshipped at least two gods that were flies. So again, God is very purposeful in his plagues. Pretty cool as I see that here. So now, now God is giving them from now going from the, the lice to the flies. He's giving these folks all that they could handle. Everything that they could handle is coming right in their face. You know, looking at their gods, looking at their god of the flies, too many flies would gross you out, huh? Too many flies is like, yuck, I, that's sick. But I can tell you what, we can never get too much of God, can we? You and I can never get too much of God in our lives. When we don't get enough of God in our lives or the things of God is when we start feeling deficient. We start feeling like empty. Kind of like, hey, Lord, I, I need to sit with you. Lord, I, I, we long to hear from God. Especially in those times that we're going, I haven't heard from you lately, Lord. I know you're there, so, so I need more of you, God. I need more of you and more of you and more of you. You and I never get tired of having too much God. But the Egyptians were sure tired of having too much God flies weren't they man those kinds of things you can get sick of tons of flies don't want to deal with it tons of God I want all he's got I want everything I want his fountain I want his flood on me and so we see the big big difference there verse 22 it goes on to say and, and in that day I will set apart the land of Goshen in which my people dwell that no swarms of flies shall be there in order that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the land. So now he begins to show a difference. He begins to differentiate between the children of Israel in where? The land of Goshen. Remember that's what was given to um, um, Joseph's family? Do you remember that? Jacob, all his sons. Yeah, you guys remember. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, cool. Stay with me. You guys do remember that. All right, cool. So you remember, he brings back now the land of Goshen. God is separating them out. Remember, God has always separated them out. He's always protected them. So even within this place called Egypt, God will still protect them. You know, and I look, and I look at that, and I say, wow, Lord, you know what? There are times when I am in the middle of something. I'm in the middle of a trial. I'm in the middle of a tribulation. I'm in the middle of something that is just going on around me. Yet, you still protect me. I can remember even before I was saved, the close calls that I had. You know, things in my life that I'm going, wow, Lord, in the midst of my sin, in the midst of my being, hey, eternally a waste, you know what I mean? It's like God still protected me. God still looked after me. 
And you know what? God does that. And we see him doing that with the children of Israel. Amidst everything that's going on around them, God brings that little cone of safety around them. And we're going to see this also as we get further into Scripture. He yet says it again, that he is going to differentiate between the children of Israel in the land of Goshen and the Egyptians. So many times we can feel that, you know, a lot of people have come to me and, and said, you know, man, the place I work is just, man, it's just a, a, a terrible place. The place I, I go to school is just filled with all of this and all of that. Or man, the, the people that I've been just, you know, that I run into, or they're just like, oh, I just don't want to deal with them because they're just so of the world. Well, know this, that God will protect you. In your workplace, God will protect you. There are many people that where they're the only Christians in their homes or in their families. While their families are living a life of worldly pursuits, whatever that may entail, there they are in that place. And it's like, you know, maybe some of you have been raised that way. Um, and, you know, God protects his people because he loves you guys. He protects you and he has protected you. And, and know this, that he will always, always protect you. No matter what's going on, he will protect you, he will protect your children, he will protect your spouses, he will protect your household. He will. It shows us here how he does that. And so we see here that he begins now to, to, to show that difference, that difference between the children of Israel and the people of Egypt. You know, and, and as we talk about the differentiation between the land of Goshen and we see here these swarms of flies that he kept them. This was by, you know, you know, we talk about in the Bible, the law of first mention. You guys have heard me say that, right? Well, this is the law of first mention when it comes to the first time ever mentioned, the no fly zone. <laughs> hey, you guys laughed. All right, here we go. All right. That was bad. All right. Verses 23 and 24. I will make a difference between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall be. And the Lord did so. Thick swarms of flies came into the house of Pharaoh, into his servants' houses, and into the land of Egypt. The land was corrupted because of the swarms of flies. So we see here, the flies are in Egypt. I talked to you about what kind of a fly it probably was, a big old livestock type fly. And um, you know those flies that are here in Williamsburg? Those little bitty dark flies that you can't see and then all of a sudden they're around your ankles and they start to bite you? I don't know what they call them, but they're just irritating. And they bite. And it's like, they're not like that. They're much bigger. And much more heavier than that and much more of a scary thing. But we see that, you know, and um, I don't like flies. Do you guys like flies? I don't like flies, you know. So I was thinking about flies. What does God do with me over flies? He's given me full dominion over flies. You know that, don't you? I have full dominion over flies that he's given me to kill the flies. I can do that. In my house, I'm the hunter. That's me. I get to kill those flies. So no, you too. That's a God-given right. You can kill those flies in your own home. Let's move on. Verse 25. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Go sacrifice your God in the land of Israel. This begins here the first of four compromises that Pharaoh is going to do. First of four compromises that we see that Pharaoh is going to do with Moses. One of the things he says, go sacrifice your God in the land. What's he talking about? He's talking about go sacrifice in the land of Egypt. But remember, God said these children are to go out into the wilderness, 
out of the land of Egypt. So we see that Pharaoh is saying, yeah, yeah, no problem. Go ahead and sacrifice in the land. But that's not what God wants. But Pharaoh says, hey, do it in the land, no problem. God wants them out of the land sacrificing in the wilderness out of the land of Egypt very important to note that and and we we could skip that over you know as we're reading it but you know here it's it's very important to know that these compromises that that Pharaoh is trying to do and so so you know that's something important that we take note of so we go further now in scripture and we see here that uh, in verse 26 and Moses said it is not right to do so for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to the Lord our God if we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians before their eyes. Then they will not stone us. Then will they not stone us? Well, yeah. I mean, the Lord's giving Moses some, some great wisdom here. And, and we see, and you guys all know that, that, that Egypt is a type of the world. It's a typology it's for the world. And, and Pharaoh is a type of Satan, right? So, so knowing that and understanding that is that as seen these two verses, as God gives wisdom to Moses, but previous to that, Moses is saying, you know what, um, if I was to do it here in the land, you know, your people would see that because everything that we sacrifice, the bulls and goats, man, you got a God. They're one of your gods. So guess what? They'd stone us. They'd kill us because we're sacrificing probably one of your gods, regardless of what it was. The chances are they were doing that. So God gave Moses a lot of wisdom there. But also know this too, that no different from Pharaoh, Satan, doing the same thing, is saying this to you and to me tonight. He's saying, hey, you know what? Go ahead. Go ahead and sacrifice who you want to, or whatever you want in the land. You know, and remember, Egypt, type of the world, Satan, Pharaoh, types of each other. Stay with me here where I'm going with this. Because Satan, like Pharaoh, wants, you, wants to keep you still close. Close within his grasp. Close within his sights. Close within he can see you. And he's going, go ahead, Christian. Go ahead and, and do what you want to do, man. Go ahead, all you Christians, and just, you know, yeah, go to church. No problem. I'm okay with that. But you know what? I'm still going to tie you up over here because you're not out of the land. Remember, God tells us that what? That we are in the world, but we're not to be a part of the world. And this is the same thing that we're talking here, is that Satan wants to keep you in the land. But we are called to be what? Separate, huh? A separated, sanctified people. And that's what God is trying to do here with the, with the children of Israel. That's why he's saying you're to be out of the land of Egypt. Very important that we see that, that Pharaoh and the typology of those two things, Satan wants to do the same. Yeah, go ahead. No problem. But you know what? You're going to be close to me. And I'm still going to keep you tied up with the things. And so, you know what? We are called to sever and to cut and to get out of those things that hold us down. Those things that are strapping us down spiritually. Things that we struggle with. And so, you know what? We, we need to get out of the land. So if you find yourself in the land tonight, know this, Satan doesn't want you out of it. He wants to keep you there. You need to get out of the land. You need to get into that wilderness. Because remember I said a few weeks ago, the wilderness was good for the children of Israel for a time. But the better thing was to be into the promised land. That was the better thing. So we see here and we go a little further. It's... Um, Knowing us as Christians, we, you and I, can never, how can I place this? We can never experience the fullness of Christ. We can never experience the fullness of God, what he wants to do in our lives, 
if we are still hanging around the things of the world. You know, I mean, again, if we're filled up with those things, there's not any more room to be filled up with the things of the Lord. We need to get out, get out, get out. And so we see a neat response in that verse 26. And I already explained what was going on there with, with verse 26. In verse 27, um, he says, will, will we go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice the Lord our God as He will command us? Or we will go. That's his statement. He's making that statement here. A very bold statement he's making to Pharaoh. Verse 28. So Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go very far away. Intercede for me. Here we go. Yet with another compromise. The second compromise that, that Pharaoh is making. He's saying, you know what? I'll let you go into the wilderness, but not very far because I still want to see you. I still want to see where you're at. I still want to see what you're doing. I don't want to get too far. You get too far. And, and know this again, that um, Satan does the same thing in our lives. You know, sometimes we're flirting with danger. Sometimes we're flirting with temptation. Sometimes we're flirting with those types of things that are going to cause us to stumble or worse yet, backslide, get back into the things of the world. Why? Because we're on the edge. We're on the edge. And Satan can see what's going on. And he's like, yeah, you're close. All I've got to do is just kind of tug on you a little bit. And I got you again. So you see, we need to not only get out of the land, but we need to get far away from the edge. You know, I, I, I talk to a, a lot of people about situations like this. And you know what? We are always, just seems like, just always living on the edge spiritually. Because so many of us can fall back or fall over that cliff and we need to step back way back. We need to be way back away from that. Away from falling. Away from slipping. And we're to be out. Out of that land. Yes, Satan will, will continue to lie to you. And, and deceive you. And twist things around. And he's fine with saying... You know, you go ahead and you get saved. You, you go ahead and do your thing with the church. You go ahead and serve. But I want to keep my eye on you. I, I want you to know that I'm still watching after you. And I'm looking for that opportunity to cause you to stumble. For you to backslide. I mean, that's what, that's what Satan does. And so that's why I keep saying, it's like, you know, we can't be close to these things. We can't be flirting with temptation, flirting with the possibility of, of falling back. We, we need to move forward and get out. We need to move forward and get out. And we go on now in verse uh, 27. We will go three days' journey into the wilderness and sacrifice the Lord our God as He will command so Pharaoh said, I will let you go that you may sacrifice the Lord your God in the wilderness. Only you shall not go far away. Intercede for me. Verse uh, 29. Then Moses said, Indeed, I am going out from you. I will entreat the Lord that the swarms of flies may depart tomorrow from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. But let Pharaoh no, not deal deceitfully any more in not letting the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. What's he saying here? He's saying, Listen, stop your lying. Quit lying is what he's saying. And he's being bold here because remember who Pharaoh is. He's saying, quit your lying, Pharaoh. Quit dealing deceitfully because you've said this too many times. Verse 30. So Moses went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. He removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. But Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also. Neither would he let the people go. 
Wow. Here we go. Pharaoh is not changing his song, huh? He's not changing what he's doing. Even after Moses held him accountable, it's like, man, he's just not getting it. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. Here's another attempt. God's giving. Verse 2, For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, verse 3, Behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. What is pestilence? It's a disease. So we see here that the Lord is going to bring an incredible severe disease on the animals. Specifically, it says here, those in the field. You can underline or circle in the field because as we get further on in Scripture, um, in verse 19, you may think, well, wait a minute, weren't they already destroyed and this and that? Well, he's talking about the ones in the field, okay? So that kind of helps you understand as we get to verse 19. There's no uh, conflict there. And you know what? Um, we see here that he's, he's giving them notice here on what's going to happen. And so, you know, he wants them to be aware. And he's saying, you know, this is what's going to happen on all your cattle. So get them into a safe place. You know, get them in or get them into this area because otherwise a severe pestilence will fall on them. Verse 4. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Egypt. Here we see, you know, he's doing the pestilence. That's plague number five. And um, he's showing again the differentiation of the two. And know this, you know, the, the, the animals of that time, you were, your wealth wasn't judged by how much you had in a bank. But your wealth was judged by how much livestock you owned and, and all of that, you know. And so here, the Lord is going to rock them financially. He's going to cause them economic ruin because he's, he's, he's hitting where it hurts, in the billfold, you know, which is the animals, the livestock. And so we see here what, what God is doing. And then he's showing, of course, in, in verse 4, a differentiation between the livestock of the children of Israel and the livestock of Egypt, knowing that nothing that belongs to the children of Israel will be touched. Verse 5, Then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing. So here he gives them that out. Um, verse 5, Then the, uh, or verse 6, So the Lord said, did this thing on the next day, and the livestock of Egypt died. But of the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Verse 7. Then Pharaoh sent, and indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So even here, we see the Lord promising what was going to happen. He's allowed it to happen. He's done it, and then Pharaoh sends out some of his guys to check things out. And indeed, hey, their livestock was alive. Go figure, their livestock's alive. Now, we go back in further now in verse 8. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourselves handfuls of ashes from the furnace, and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens of the side of, in the sight of Pharaoh. And it will become fine dust in the land of Egypt, and it will cause boils that break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Wow. Here we get into the other plagues, okay? The other plagues are starting, and he's starting what? Boils. Boils. Have you guys ever had boils? They're painful. I've never had a boil, but I've seen pictures of them in, you know, magazines, scientific magazines and whatnot, and in health class, I remember in high school. And it's like, wow, they look very painful. And so we see here that, you know what? The Lord is bringing this on everything and everyone. Not only the man, not only man, but the beast as well throughout all the land. So we see here that they're covered from head to toe. And then, in verse 10, 
as they took the ashes, ashes from the furnace, stood before Pharaoh, and Moses scattered them toward heaven, they caused the boils that break out in sores on man and beast. Verse 11, And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all the Egyptians. Interesting, huh? The magicians couldn't deal with it. The magicians couldn't even make it disappear from their own body. So we see here as things kind of go on, and I kind of wonder, you know, well, what are these guys thinking at this time? Everything's happened to their cattle. Those that are surviving, they've got boils. The cattle have boils. Now, these guys and all the people, they have boils. It's like, what are these guys thinking? What's the conclusion that you guys would come up with if you were the Egyptians? Well, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, does it? But whose God is being shown as the greater? Well, our God, of course. And so now he's kind of giving them a, maybe an opportunity. Anybody interested in changing gods? Anybody willing now to change from the gods that, that you've been worshiping, that have not helped you, that I have shown you, that have no power to me? Again, remember like I said in the beginning, God is giving you an opportunity for them to repent. God's given an opportunity for them to turn to Him. The plagues aren't just for the sake of the children of Israel, but so that they can turn to the one true living God, the God of the Hebrews. And so we see that's going on here as well. And so, you know, one of the things is, as, as Moses continues to harden his heart, let's get into verse 12. But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh... And he did not heed them just as the Lord had spoken. Wow. At this point, things are a little different. What happens? The Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. What does that mean to us? Well, you can go through on your own reading. Read Romans 7. It'll give you way more detail. We don't have detail or time to go into it tonight. But you know what? In Romans 7, it will give you more detail related to all of this. Um, but we see here pretty much that the Lord is showing Pharaoh his sovereignty. He's showing Pharaoh his power. And so by this, now, the Lord is hardening his heart. What does that mean, though? Is that, is that mean of God to do that? To harden the heart of this person, this human? Well, no, not at all. It's not mean. We see that God has given him many opportunities Many chances. But what God is doing is confirming Pharaoh's decision. We need to realize that. Because that's also what happens in people's lives. As they live a life saying, I don't want God. I don't want Jesus. I don't want anything to do with your God. I don't, this and that. This and that. I don't want. I don't want. I don't want to deal with it. You know what? There will be a confirming. And the confirmation will definitely come when they die. When they die and they go to meet the Lord at the great white throne judgment, Confirma confirmation of their hardened heart will be confirmed at that moment. Very sobering as we think about that. That it isn't, that as God doesn't harden the heart, but he confirms what the decision that is made by that individual, by that person. The decision's made, he confirms it. That's what we see God doing here. So now God steps in, he confirms everything of Pharaoh's heart. And we see that, as I talked about, for those who reject Christ, the same thing happens. Verses 13 and 14, Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart and on your servants and your people that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. So here we go again. He's going to be releasing some more plagues. And he says, You know what, Pharaoh? There's more coming. There's more coming, Pharaoh, so hold on. Hold on. God here is saying, I have yet to even begin to break a sweat. I haven't even sweated here. You know what? It's like, but you wait, Pharaoh. Now I'm going to start. Now I'm going to begin. 
You can't ever outlast me, says the Lord. I will last. I will be the one to, to, to win. And then we saw and we see in, in verse 15, he says, Now if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut from the earth. Hey, he says, I haven't even begun, man. I haven't even begun, Pharaoh, because I could have wiped you out already. I could have killed you already. Now we see here in verse 15, now if I, or in 16, but indeed for this purpose I have raised you up. So who raises man up? Who exalts man? Who brings him to powers of authority? God says it here. But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up. That why? I may show my power in you and that my name may de be declared in all the earth. You see, that, that's what God does. God has used Pharaoh from the very moment of his birth. He's used him for this time so that God's power will be shown through him. Through what God has been doing and the power will be shown through the hardening, hardening of Pharaoh's heart and all the different things that God is doing. He's saying, this is how powerful I am. This is what I'm all about. And so we see him doing that. Verse 17, as you exalt yourself against my people in that you will not let them go. Behold, tomorrow about this time I will cause a very heavy hail and rain down such as not has been seen in Egypt since its founding until now. Verse 19, therefore send now and gather your livestock and now all that you have in the field for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home and they shall die. For he who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and his livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven. Here he goes. Then the Lord sent thunder and hail, and fire darted to the ground. The Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with hail, so very heavy that there were none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt and the, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb in the field and broke every tree of the field. Uh, let's continue on. I just lost my praise. Here we go. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail, again separating them out. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron, said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and my people and I are wicked. Verse 28. Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough, he says. I will let you go and you shall stay no longer. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord and thunder will cease and there will be no more hail that you may know that the earth is the Lord. So here we go again. Moses coming back saying, You know what? I have sinned. You know what? And, and you know, I, people do this all the time. Oh, man, I've sinned and this and that. And, oh, Lord, forgive me, forgive me. And they go right back doing what they were doing before. It's hard. It's difficult. I know. But we need to continue to, to persevere and hold fast. Verse 30 through 32. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not fear the Lord God. See, he knows it. He knows it. Now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in the head and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck for their late crops. Again, remember, this was a period of over like maybe eight to nine months or so. So it had time. Things that were not destroyed by other, it, by other plagues were now starting to grow and bud. And so we see here that this period of time, these things weren't destroyed by the fire and so forth. So verse 33, So Moses went out to the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more. The guy doesn't learn. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken to Moses. 
So, we end this particular chapter and a half tonight seeing that things aren't changing for Pharaoh or the children of Israel. And one thing that I pray that you guys take away with you this evening as we've read many scripture tonight is that, number one, that Satan will do everything he can to keep you in the land. Satan will do everything he can to keep you within close proximity so that you will stumble, that you will fall. Also, that in what Satan will do in perverting or twisting around things is that he will want to keep you from the things of God. And by doing that, it's just keeping you further away from the Lord. And so we need to, as Christians, stay closer to the Lord. Reading your word. That's my encouragement to you tonight. Read your word. Be in the word. Stay close to the Lord. Step far away from that particular uh, cliff. If you find yourself in the land tonight, if you find yourself out of the land but close to it, the Lord is telling you tonight, keep walking. Keep getting out. Walking further and further and further away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this time. And Lord, I thank you that through your word, Lord, and we see here that through the example of Pharaoh, that, you know, Lord, that the enemy, God, wants to keep us within his clutches. He wants to keep us lied to. He wants to keep us deceived. He wants to tell us that we're no good or it's not worth it. Stay where we're at. There's no need to grow. But God loves us just the way we are which is true, but, you know, Lord, you, you desire us to grow. You desire us to mature. And you desire us to be, be involved in the things of you. You don't desire us to be spiritually deficient, Lord, or spiritually babes in Christ, as you tell us in the Word. So, God, I know that tonight you're telling each and every one of us to be watchful, to be aware that, that we are out of the land and heading towards a promised land, God. God, you have already given us the rest. You've already given us the peace. So, God, there's no need to turn back. There's nothing good for us in Egypt. Nothing good for us that Satan can ever do for us, Lord. He's a killer and he's a destroyer. And so, God, I ask that you protect this flock here, your flock. I ask that you protect your sheep, God. And, I'm, Lord, I pray that you just give them wisdom. Wisdom from on high, Lord, from your Holy Spirit. Give them discernment. Lord, I pray. And it's in your son's name I ask. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Um, if you need prayer, come forward. Keith is here. Tony's here. We'd love to pray for you guys. And so, um, God bless you. We'll see you Sunday at the library.